بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah and may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah ta'ala, I want to share with you another story from amongst the stories of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This story that I want to share with you is found in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So another authentic story from amongst the qisas or the stories of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The narrator of this hadith, this story is Abdullah ibn Umar. That is Abdullah ibn Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu ma. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them both. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Ibn Umar and be pleased with his father Umar al-Faruq radiallahu anhu. So, the uh, the title of this week's lecture is The Story of Three Men Trapped in a Cave and Their Miraculous Exit. The Prophet ﷺ said that there were three persons, three men of a people before you. So this is did not this story did not happen during the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, but it actually happened before his time. And these three men were on a journey when they were overtaken by a storm. Clouds gathered, the weather changed, rain started to come, fall down, and therefore they wanted to take shelter, and so they found a cave. And they entered this cave. Now, the scholars of Islam tried to work out where this cave is and there are those who said that it sounds as though it happened in Palestine given the uh, mountainous terrain of, uh, of Palestine. However, we don't know exactly where this took place. And then there are reports that when did it happen? Was it during the time of Banu Israel, the children of Israel? Again, this hadith does not uh, tell us, this hadith does not really indicate uh, which people um, it happened during whose time or whose era. So they entered this cave to seek shelter. And then what happened is that due to the stormy weather, a rock slipped down from the mountain and blocked the exit of the cave. And this was the only exit from this cave. Subhanallah, they were trying to run away from the, you know, the storm and the rain and be protected from this. Little did they know that they're actually entering, entering a cave or entering that which will subject them to a much bigger trial and put their lives into more danger. So, one of them, one of these three men, he said, the only way of, or the only way for deliverance, and the only way we're going to get out of this cave, there's no other exit, is to beseech Allah Azza wa Jal. Is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of some virtuous deed, some good action, some good deed. So each one of them now is going to mention a good deed coupled with the dua so that perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will pro provide a way for them to exit this cave. So one of them began to supplicate. One of the three men, he said, Ya Rabb, O Lord, my parents were very old and I used to offer them their nightly drink of milk before my children and the other members of the family. 
He would come home, bring some milk with him, give the milk to his parents first, then he would give to his children, he would give to his wife. One day I went astray far away in search of green trees and could return only after my parents had gone to sleep. So he was held back with his work, he comes home and his parents have already gone to sleep. They were fast asleep, but I did not like to disturb them, nor would give any part of the milk to my children and other members of the family till after my parents had their drink. Thus, with the vessel in hand, I awaited their awakening to the flush of dawn. While the children cried out of hunger at my feet, when they woke up, they had their drink. So he refused to give the milk to his children out of the respect and the love, the bir, the dutifulness that he had towards his parents. So his children are, are, are at his feet. And you know, um, also a parent has a lot of love for his, for his children. Seeing your children crying, you know, really in need of that milk, yet, no. He insisted that his parents drink first, and then his children and other family members. So then he says, he says, O oh Lord, Ya Rabb, if I did this, if I did this, seeking only your pleasure, then do relieve us of the distress brought upon us by this rock. So then what happened? The rock moved. It moved a little, but not enough for them to pass out. Not enough for them to exit the cave. So already a miracle has begun. The rock has moved. And now they can see a little bit of daylight. Then the second man, he makes dua. And he supplicates. And he says, O oh Lord, I had a cousin. I had a cousin whom I loved her more passionately than any loves a woman. I tried to seduce her, but she would have none of me till in a season of great hardship due to famine, she approached me for help. And I gave her 120 dinars. I gave her 120 dinars on condition that she would have relations with me. Haram relations, as you know. She agreed. And when we got together, and I, was, and I was just going to have relations with her, she pleaded, Fear Allah. She said to him, Fear Allah, ittaqillah, and do not break the seal unlawfully. Whereupon I moved away from her, despite the fact that I desired her most passionately. And I let her keep the money I had given her. So, he turned away from committing haram. And he said, O oh Lord, if I did this, seeking only your pleasure, then do move the distress in which we find ourselves in. Again, the rock moved. A little, but not enough for them to pass out of this cave. And then now the third man, he supplicates and he makes a dua to Allah Azza wa Jal, adding a righteous deed that he did for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So then the third supplicated, O oh Lord, I hired some laborers and paid them their dues but one of them left leaving behind what was due to him. So he left behind his wage, he didn't collect his wage. So now the employer invested it in business and the business prospered greatly. After a time the laborer came back and he said, O servant of Allah, hand me or hand over to me my wages. So the employee 
He's coming back after such a long period of time and he's asking his employer, his ex-employer, to give him back only what was due to him in terms of the wage that he left with him. So the employer, he said, all that you see is yours. All that you see in front of you is yours. Camels, cattle, goats, slaves, all of this is yours. He said, don't play a joke with me. He found it, what are you saying? I, I earned a few dollars, yes, or a few dinars. But to say that all of this is mine, I can't understand this. He said, O servant of Allah, uh, I assured him I am not joking. So his employer assured him that this wasn't a joke. So what did he do? He took all of it, sparing nothing. He didn't even say to him, you can keep here as a token of my appreciation, you can keep this amount or keep this or keep that. No, he took everything. He took everything. And then he said, this, uh, this uh, businessman or this uh, the employer, he said, Oh Lord, if I did this, seeking only your pleasure, then do relieve us of our distress. So what happened next? The rock moved again and all three came out of the cave safe and sound. And that is the end of the hadith, the end of the story mentioned to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Hands up if you've heard this story before. Okay, there's a few more hands this time than the previous times. I wonder why. Anyway, we'll talk about that maybe later on. Um, another story from amongst the stories of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what is amazing, this story wasn't a very long story, maybe not as long as some of the previous stories that we've mentioned. But uh, the scholars of Islam have produced many uh, lessons and many gems, many uh, pearls of wisdom that we can extract from this story. I wonder how many you've, you've extracted. I did say that inshallah in one of the, um, the, the stories we'll get you to do the, uh, the lessons for us inshallah ta'ala. So it will be you sharing with us. Uh, the lessons. But today I'm going to give you a break, inshallah, but be prepared, be prepared. Okay, the first lesson that we can deduce or extract from this story is that it is permitted, it is permissible to make tawassul to Allah through righteous actions. Tawassul, what does that mean? Tawassul is intercession, intercession. Now, there is good intercession and there is uh, a bid'ah intercession or a haram intercession. So, when it comes to uh, tawassul, for example, at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, people would come and ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make something happen. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was alive, yes, they would come to him and he would beseech, he would invoke, he would call upon Allah Azza wa Jal to bring about uh, a change uh, of, يعني, a change in the state of affair of things or whatever it might be. So for example, the man who came and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on the member and he said that you know, they needed rain. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raised his hands and he made dua and he invoked Allah Azza wa Jal until it rained. And it rained so much that man came back the following Friday and he said, Ya, ya Rasulullah, too much rain. Um, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua and he said, around us and not on us. So the rain is still good. Um, and then this is an example of people coming to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interceding and using the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as between them and Allah Azza wa Jal to bring about um, some change or something which is beneficial. Now once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has died, you cannot ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
And you cannot use the Prophet as intercession. Some people, they still do. They call upon the dead. Not only do they call upon the Prophet وسلم, but they call upon uh, so-called saints, you know, wali, awliya, and they call upon righteous people. This is all haram. This is not legislated. Because had it been legislated, then at the time of the Sahaba, they would have, the Sahaba would have endorsed, would have endorsed uh, the, the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is there, the grave is there, and they would have gone to his grave, but they didn't go to his grave. Which shows that it's impermissible. It is not permitted to ask the Prophet ﷺ whilst he is dead. Whilst he was alive, yes. You could go up to him and ask him to make dua. And whatever would happen, any change of affairs, or any change uh, that would come about, would happen of course by the permission of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is something that we need to remember insha'Allah. So when it comes to tawassul, intercession, you can make intercession uh, through righteous actions as we learned in this lesson, or from this hadith. What do we mean by that? So for example, you've done an action, and you know in your heart that you did it purely for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. So what you do, you ask Allah, you say, Oh Allah, you know I did such and such for your sake. I ask you by this action. I ask you through this righteous action that I've done for your sake. I ask you, Ya Allah, to please bring about, uh, or give me, or bless me, or, or ward off this harm, whatever it might be. So this is permissible. Now of course you can also intercede through the names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. Asma'ihi wa sifati. So, you know, you can say, Ya Hayyu, Ya Qayyum, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, um, Ya, you know, any of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal, you can use them to intercede when asking Allah Azza wa Jal. This is a, another legislated form of, of intercession. Tawassul, as it's called. Tawassul. Um, there is a good book written about Tawassul by Shaykh Al-Albani Rahimahullah Ta'ala I recommend if you are interested in this topic To read this book called Tawassul It's in Arabic, it's in English um, But that will give you a lot more uh, information about the concept and the, and the area of Tawassul Between what is permissible and what is impermissible Another lesson number two is the power and the fruits of Taqwa we learn about the power and the fruits of taqwa in rescuing a person from his trial, or from her trial, or from a challenging and difficult situation. That when you have the, the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal, when you are, when you are a person who, who fears Allah, who reveres Allah, who is always conscious of Allah, this taqwa can deliver you out of distress and out of misfortunes and out of calamities. And we see that these three men that entered this cave, they seem to be people who fear Allah Azza wa Jal. We can tell by their actions that they stated that they are people who Allah is a priority in their life. Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Talaq, uh, verse number 2, He says, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجَعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ That is, whoever has the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal provides for him a way out, a makhraj. Makhraj is an exit. So, it's, the condition is, if you want for there to be exits during times of difficulty, during difficult moments of your life, difficult chapters of your life, then it needs to be taqwa. There needs to be the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. And those who remember Allah Azza wa Jal during the times of ease, He will remember them during the times of hardship. So this is another lesson that we learned, that these three men, they had remembered Allah Azza wa Jal during the times of ease, and when a difficult moment overcame them, or they were overcome by this challenge, by this difficulty, Allah Azza wa Jal provided for them a way out from where they least expected it. And that's why 
in this very ayah that I read to you from Surah Al-Talaq, وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَيَرْزُقْهُ And not only does he, not only does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide a way out, but he gives you risk, sustenance. He blesses you from where you least expect it. From where you least expect it, it comes. Subhanallah, you have no idea and you think that's it. There's no way out of this. There's no way out whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, Allah Azza wa Jal, He blesses you from where you least expect it. This is why it's important to always be maintaining a strong connection with Allah Azza wa Jal. The third lesson that we can deduce from this story is the importance of dua, the importance of supplication, invocation, beseeching Allah Azza wa Jal. Always, dua is the weapon of a believer. Dua is the weapon of a believer, of a mu'min, of a Muslim. So, uh, especially when a trial um, or difficult or difficulty befalls uh, a Muslim, and Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded us. Allah Azza wa Jal has commanded us to make dua to Him, as we read in Surah Ghafir, verse sixty. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ And your Lord has said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمُ دُعُونِي That means call upon me, make dua, call upon me, أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ I will answer your, uh, I will answer you, in other words, I will answer and I will respond to your supplication. Allah Azza wa Jal is me. And that's why in Surah Al-Baqarah, after the ayat of Siyam and fasting Ramadan, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِ And when my servant asks you about me, I am me. I answer the supplication. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ I answer the supplication of the supplicator when he calls upon me. So, dua. And the Prophet ﷺ said, الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ That by you making dua, even though you're asking for yourself, even though you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, endow, you with, endow you with one of His uh, blessings and favors, this asking in and, in and of itself is an act of worship. So you will be also rewarded for your act of worship. When it comes to dua, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, sometimes Allah Azza wa Jal will answer your dua and will give you what you want. Or sometimes He will remove some sort of harm. So He might not give you what you want, but He might remove a harm or an evil that was about to before you. Or the third instance is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He uh, postpones the fruits of that dua until the Day of Judgment until the hereafter. So your dua is never lost. Your dua never goes to waste. It is never in vain. Dua is ibadah. And in another hadith, مَن لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ يَقْضَبْ عَلَيْهِ Whoever doesn't ask Allah, Allah becomes angry with him. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal. Even if it's for something very, very minute, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you make your decisions through Salat al-Istikhara, which is a Salat, two rak'at, apart from the Fard that you pray, and then you make Dua al-Istikhara, you say the actual wording, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you guidance. And from amongst the Dua that you can always say during the times of difficulty and hardship, Allahumma alhimni rushdi, وَقِنِي شَرَّ نَفْسِي O oh Allah, inspire me, alhimni rushdi, inspire me with guidance and protect me from the evil of my own self. Allahumma alhimni rushdi, وَقِنِي شَرَّ نَفْسِي This is the state of a mu'min, a believer who is always turning back to Allah Azza wa Jal during the times of hardship, during the times of distress, during the times of calamity. For Wallahi, it is only Allah Azza wa Jal who can remove that from you. 
As we saw in the story, these people, they turn to Allah through the dua and look at, look at the fruits of the dua. Uh, we move on inshallah ta'ala to the, the, the fourth lesson. The fourth lesson that we can deduce from this story is to do with birrul walidain. Dutifulness towards parents and being good to your parents. As we saw in the story of this uh, man who would not give his own children milk before giving to his parents. So, birrul walidain, dutifulness towards parents is from amongst the most beloved of righteous actions and deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is one of the best actions that bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Birrul walidain. You want to get closer to Allah azza wa jal, make sure that you are close to your parents. Make sure you are close to your parents. Um, it is also one of the ways that liberates a person from the hardships of dunya and the hereafter. You want to be liberated from hardships in this life. You want to be freed and liberated from the hardships of the hereafter. Then make sure you are connecting with your parents. You are maintaining the ties of kinship. That you are practicing birrul walidain in all of its forms. It could be, you know, subhanAllah, it could be an SMS that you send your parents every day to remind them that you love them. It could be a phone call. It could be a visit. It could be helping or helping out. Any way of communicating your love and your respect towards them is part of birrul walidain. We move on inshallah ta'ala. But before I do, I want to make a point regarding birrul walidain as we can also see in this hadith, in this story, is that preference should be given to the service of parents even over the service of one's own wife and children. Servicing your, your parents comes or uh, precedes the service of your own uh, spouse, your own wife, or your children. So remember this inshallah. This is how important it is to practice Virgul uh, Walidain. The fifth lesson that we can deduce from this story is fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is from the acts of worship that ward off harm and that protects a person from falling into promiscu promiscuous promiscuous acts. We have fahisha as they call it. And if we uh, reflect, if we reflect on the story, we find that it was the fear of Allah that led, that led to the man abstaining from committing zina. It was the fear of Allah that prevented him from falling into the fahisha, <coughs> into fornication, and which was one of the reasons that made them exit the cave. So the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. When you have the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, that can prevent and ward off many harms in your life. Number six, the sixth lesson that we can learn from this story is that not everyone that commits a sin is destroyed and deserves the punishment of Allah. A person may work and take the steps towards committing a sin just like the one who wanted to commit zina with his cousin in the story. However, he repented and he turned away before actually going ahead, going ahead with the sin out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person is actually rewarded for abstaining his nafs from, his, from, from committing this sin. He abstained and he didn't, uh, he didn't actually obey his desires. A person may commit a sin and he may repent. And Allah accepts his tawbah. Allah accepts his repentance. And his situation after the repentance is actually better than his condition before his repentance. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts you in certain situations and He wants you to repent. He wants you to turn back to Him. And that situation and that repentance, that repentance makes you a better person than what you were previously to this situation. Another lesson from amongst the lessons that we can deduce from this story number seven is that sometimes, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, 
we come across some very difficult moments in our lives, very challenging, trialing moments, or circumstances that may push us, that may push a person who loves and fears Allah to committing haram. Even though you fear Allah, even though you love Allah, but sometimes some situations are so, so, so difficult that, it can, that, that even the best of us can find ourselves going towards the haram, heading towards the haram. And we saw this in the story whereby the female cousin, she was in need of that money. She was in such need of that money that she accepted to do haram with, it, with her cousin. She accepted that. But remember, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, that help may, may, may be just around the corner. Sometimes we're hasty. Sometimes we think, no, we, just have, we, we can't stand this anymore. We can't bear this anymore. But sometimes the help is just around the corner. If only we practiced a little bit more sabr. If only we practiced a little bit more patience. And this is why again and again in the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jal in over 100 places, some 102 places in the Qur'an, Allah talks about sabr, patience, and the importance of patience. So let us always remain patient and not be hasty. Because when we are hasty, we could be forfeiting something which is beneficial and very good for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Yusuf, He says, إِنَّهُ إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِ إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِ وَيَصْبِرِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That indeed, those who have taqwa, those who have the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِ وَيَصْبِرِ And has patience. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِعُ أَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ that when you have taqwa, when you have the fear of Allah, and you reveal Allah Azza wa Jal, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَبْتَقِ وَيَصْبِرْ And he has patience. Allah does, will not allow for the reward of the, uh, the muhsin, the good doer, to be lost. These are two very important ingredients to remember, especially when you are going through challenging moments of your life. If you are going through a challenging moment in your life, then remember these two things. Remember taqwa. Remember to fear Allah Azza wa Jal because as I said earlier, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا And whoever has the taqwa of Allah, the fear of Allah, Allah provides a way out for him. Just like He provided for these people in the cave. وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا So and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّهُ مَن يَتَّقِ وَيَصْبِرْ Those who have taqwa, those who have sabr, Allah will Will, will, will reward them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not uh, allow for the reward or the compensation to be lost. You will be compensated in one way or another for your difficulty, for your losses, for your hardship. But just be patient. It will happen. It could be just around the corner. Remember this, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam. The eighth lesson that we can deduce from this story is the virtue and the merit of safeguarding the rights of others. If someone entrusts you with something, look after it. It's an amana. An amana is a trust. If somebody gives you something and says, can you please take care of this for me? Whatever it is, whatever it is, then we, we have a duty, we have a duty before Allah Azza wa Jal to take care of that which is, which is entrusted to us. It's just part of Islam, part of Iman, that we, we look after, that we safeguard other people's properties and other people's amanat. So we saw in the story how the employer, he preserved the wage of his employee and he invested it on his behalf. He actually went extra and he, uh, he invested it for him. And he gave him everything as a result of that investment. And that man, he spared nothing. He took everything. Another lesson that we can deduce from this story, number nine, is that laborers, workers, people who are working for you, should always be treated fairly. Should always be treated fairly. 
Do not oppress your employees. Do not oppress them. Do not oppress those who you owe money towards, even though they may be rich. If you owe somebody money, and you have agreed to pay it on a certain date, then Islam teaches us to pay your debts on time. And in one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَطْلُ الْغَنِيِّ ظُلُمْ That when you postpone, when you postpone your creditor, this is a form of oppression. And when you commit oppression in this dunya, oppression will be multiplied for you on the Day of Judgment. So be careful my dear brothers and sisters. Don't oppress anybody. Don't oppress yourselves. Because that's what you're doing. By oppressing others, you are actually oppressing yourself. So, um, if someone has paid uh, to a laborer less than his due, okay, this is, this is a form of oppression. And of course, you should pay your employee or your laborers in a decent manner. Uh, the tenth lesson that we can deduce from this story is that it is legislated to spend the wealth of others in your possession if there is a benefit in doing so for the owner. So if someone gives you money and it's just sitting there and you want to invest it for that person so that maybe it's not eaten up by zakat because you know once wealth sits there, there's going to be zakat that is uh, payable. That's of course if it reaches the nisab and the how it comes about. Now, um, so scholars are of the view, many scholars are of the view that you are allowed to invest the wealth of a person who has entrusted you with that wealth. However, in saying that, there is differences of opinion. Not all the ulama agree with this. There are differing views regarding this. Some allow it and some don't allow it. Now, the next lesson, number 11, the next lesson is we see that there is a barakah, there is a blessing in working in agriculture, farming. SubhanAllah, there's a lot of barakah in, in, um, in, in this field, in this area. As we saw when in the story, a small amount of wage and what it brought about in terms of cattle and camels and slaves and, and the other things that the person bought with it. We move on to the next lesson, number 12, inshallah ta'ala. And that poverty, that poverty could lead a person to commit grave sins. SubhanAllah, and maybe many of us, we don't feel that way. We, are, we have been blessed because we have wealth, alhamdulillah. We live affluent lifestyles. We live in a country whereby, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of financial support uh, from the government. Uh, we have a lot of work opportunity. But there are many people in the world, and actually 80% of the world, are poverty stricken. And some poverty may lead a person to commit crimes. It could be theft, it could be working, it could be drugs, it could be dealing with haram things, it could be prostitution. Okay? So we can learn from this story that as we, as we learn from the story with the, with, the, with the female cousin, the female cousin was ready to commit a serious offense. She was ready to fall into zina. She was ready to commit fornication because of her state. So we see that poverty could lead a person to commit a grave sin such as prostitution. Prostitution, and now in saying that, those who give sadaqah. Now remember this. So therefore, when you are giving sadaqah, now sadaqah is a charity, and the sadaqah, the word sadaqah comes from sid. It is comes from your truthfulness. And when you give sadaqah, it's a reflection of your truthfulness in your love towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when you give sadaqah to a poor woman, or when you give sadaqah to an orphan girl, or when you give sadaqah to a widow, and all these different females, not only are you being rewarded for the sadaqah, you get rewarded, you get rewarded immensely for the sadaqah, but you are also helping the prevention of these women from going to do haram. That's another benefit. And a third benefit, 
would be also um, preventing the spread of disease. And look at how many diseases we have in the world as a result of illegitimate relationships. So there's a lot of um, a lot of good that comes out of your sadaqah that you give for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Number 13, 13th lesson that we can deduce from this story is that al-ikhlas, sincerity is one of the two keys, is one of the two fundamentals for our actions being accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. Now each one of these three men, they called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they, and, and they, and they said and they, in, in the actual hadith, they said, O oh Lord, if I did this seeking only your pleasure, in other words, if I did this out of sincerity, if I did this act out of ikhlas, out of sincerity, then relieve us, make us exit out of this distress. So it's very, very clear the importance when you do an act of worship, that you do it for the sake of Allah. Don't do it to please your parents. Don't do it to please your friends. Don't do it to look good. When you do something to please Allah, Allah will be pleased with you and Allah puts pleasure into the hearts of people by automatically. So when you do an act, you do it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ That actions are based upon intentions. This is the, a, a very important uh, point. Now I said it's one of two important ingredients because we said for the, for the acceptance of any act of worship, any act of worship that you do, then there needs to be two conditions. The first condition is al-ikhlas, the sincerity. And the second condition is conformity with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the act of worship that you are doing has a basis in the Qur'an or in the action of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's very important that you, you always reflect and think, this act that I'm doing, why am I doing it? Am I doing it to seek Allah's pleasure or am I doing it for some materialistic gain? If you were doing it for some materialistic gain, change your intention. Change your niyyah. Change it. And do it for the sake of Allah. Make sure that what you were doing conforms with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we learned here the importance of sincerity. Number 14. And this is related to the sincerity point that any dua, any supplication which is made sincerely and with real sense of humbleness is granted by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Sooner or later. So you just have to be sincere and you need to call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that sooner or later your dua will be accepted inshaAllah. Number 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes he helps his pious um, men or, or people even in an unusual manner. Allah can help you in such a way where you least expect it. Which is so unusual. And you go, how did this happen? I can't believe this is happening to me. I thought I was ruined. I thought I was destroyed. I thought that's it, khalas. Nothing's going to change and deliver me out of this hardship. And then all of a sudden Allah Azza wa Jal he delivers you out of the most challenging of situations. And this is sometimes, he does it through what's known as karamat, karama. Like an extraordinary, something extraordinary happens. A miracle, like we saw in this story, whereby a rock that is blocking the cave has actually moved by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because everything happens by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is part of Qada and Qadr. That we said Qada and Qadr consists of four components. The Qada and Qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal includes that Allah Azza wa Jal has knowledge of everything. Allah knows what has happened. Allah knows what is happening. Allah knows what will happen. Allah knows how things will happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what would have happened had something happened that didn't happen. Even I get confused thinking about that one. Okay? So, uh, this is the knowledge of Allah Azza wa Jal. The second component of al qada wal Qadr is that everything has been written in Allah al Mahfuz. Everything has been written in the preserved tablet. Everything has been recorded. The third component is that Allah Azza wa Jal, everything happens 
Everything happens by the will of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the fourth component is that everything that happens is created by Allah Azza wa Jal. Qada al Qadr, the sixth tenet, the sixth pillar of Iman. So, yes, miracles can happen, even in our times. Karamat can happen. Allah can bless a person with a certain skill or ability. And, and uh, this did not only happen to the, to the prophets, but it's happened to also righteous people. And miracles and wonders both appear with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number 16, the 16th lesson that we can extract from this short story is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of His, uh, one of his names and attributes, one of His attributes is that He is as samia He is the all-hearing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from above the seven heavens, He heard the dua, He heard the supplications of these three men. Allah can hear you. You don't have to shout out to Allah azza wa jal. You don't have to be very loud. Allah Azza wa Jal hears. He knows. He hears and He sees the footsteps of the black ant under the black rock in the black night. Allah Azza wa Jal is the Osir. He is Al Basir. He is As Samir. So we need to just ask Him. We need to turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. The last point that I want to mention, inshallah Ta'ala, or last lesson, this is number 16 or number 17, is that. It is your iman, it is your faith that carries you to do good and it is your iman and your faith that will help you to keep away from haram. So it is very important to always work on your iman, to do iman workouts, iman workouts, iman boosters. You know, there are many ways of boosting your iman through the actions of the heart, through sincerity, through dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through yaqeen, having certainty, through belief, this is the actions of the heart. The actions of the tongue, by remembering Allah, saying subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu akbar, subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah al azim By reciting the Qur'an, by dua, these are ways of boosting your iman through the actions of the tongue. And then we have the actions of the limbs through the salat, through siyam, through hajj, through umrah, through sadaqah, the actions of the limbs. So when we exercise our iman through the actions of the tongue, through the actions of uh, the limbs and the actions of the heart, our iman will increase and then we'll find ourselves not committing so much haram, very minimal haram. And it is what will then drive us to commit and to do more uh, to do more uh, righteous deeds. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, these are the words I leave you with inshallah ta'ala regarding another very beautiful story from amongst the stories of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with beneficial knowledge and knowledge which, in, which is in accordance with the teachings of the Quran and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad.